to przemytło to przemyt plus tą e, e, od, e, Astronomical Observatory of the, of the Warsaw University, Dr. Ruth uh, is currently an uh, assistant professor there, or adjunct to Polish. He got his PhD in uh, 2019, yes, with distinction from the also uh, University Observatory. Then he was for two years at Polkrok in, in Caltech, uh, in Pasadena. Uh, he's a member of uh, of a numerous, uh, well, of several uh, observational uh, uh, surveys such as Ogla, um, Plant Nancy in Roman Space Telescope. Uh, he also, uh, well, I would say that I'm really impressed by the number of awards that Chenek received, including uh, Polish Astronomical Society and Research Award already two years within the PhD, yes? Yeah. Which I think is a really nice achievement. And he then, of, of course, an author of numerous papers in top journals, including Nature Science, uh, Astrophysical Journal Letters. Uh, and today he will talk about uh, the mass function of black holes. Welcome, subject. Okay, end of the night. Thank you for your introduction and uh, your invitation to give this talk. Uh, my talk will be divided into two main parts. Uh, generally, I'm going to talk about black holes. In the first part, I am going to talk about uh, observations of black holes with gravitational microlensing. And in the second part of the talk, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, if, about the question if black holes can form uh, dark matter. Uh, I think, uh, I suppose that uh, some of you may have seen this plot, which shows uh, the population of known black holes and neutron stars. And as you probably know, most of these uh, objects, most of, most of the black holes we know, have been detected recently with uh, gravitational wave detectors uh, LIGO and uh, VIRGO. Uh, they are shown here in blue. Uh, we also know a couple of uh, black holes uh, that have been detected with electromagnetic observations of stars uh, in the Milky Way. And what I think is one of the most uh, interesting um, questions of modern astrophysics is why, this topic is, is why these two populations of black holes are different. So as you can see, it seems that on average, uh, black holes detected by LIGO, Virgo, and other gravitational detectors are much more massive than those that have been detected in the Milky Way. Uh, and one of the biggest uh, questions of modern astronomy is to answer why uh, they are different. Um, and if you think about it, uh, the population of black holes detected with uh, gravitational waves, um, if, you, if you want to model that population, it's a very difficult, complex problem. Because if you want to understand the population of black holes detected with LIGO and Virgo, you have to understand evolution of massive stars. We, we suppose, we think that black holes and neutron stars are born from the evolution of massive stars. Uh, you have to understand the formation of compact objects uh, in supernova explosions. So we think that compact objects should form uh, by supernova explosions of massive stars. But some people say that black holes, uh, uh, that the formation of black holes doesn't require any supernova at all because the star can collapse to form a black hole. Uh, you have to understand, uh, in, if you want to understand the spins of black holes, you have to understand the angular momentum transfer in massive stars because, uh, like a big of uh, black holes, have been detected in binary star systems. You have to understand binary star systems, uh, mass transfer in binary star systems, common envelope phase of the binary evolution. You have to understand the physics of collisions and mergers of the stars. And on the top of that, you have to understand the impact of the environment, metallic city, uh, nearby stars, on these uh, old processes. So as you can see, uh, this is a difficult task. There are many processes that can uh, that can lead, that can affect the formation and properties of black holes and neutron stars. And uh, whenever we have a, such a complex problem, 
uh, a good idea is to try to simplify it. So instead to, to instead of trying to understand the population of all black holes in the universe that have, that have been seen by life and behavior, we should try to understand the population of black holes and neutron stars in the Milky Way, in our local environment. Mm -hmm. But I have to say that we know very little uh, about these objects in the Milky Way. So uh, here you can see uh, this chart shows the known, the population of known black holes. Most of them have been detected by gravitational waves, by like the field uh, Several objects, a couple of that, a few dozen objects, have been detected in binary star systems, uh, X-ray binary star systems. So you have a black hole and a star. Uh, the star is transferring matter onto the black hole. This gas is accreted, forms accretion disk on the black hole, uh, which emits X-rays. And this is how you can detect these objects. And we uh, know only a couple of uh, binary uh, black holes that are in wide non-interacting systems, and only one uh, black hole that has no stellar companion that is isolated. On the other hand, if you look at the predictions of theory of, theory of uh, predictions of the population synthesis models, they say that 99.5% of all black holes should be in uh, should be either isolated or in white uh, binary star systems, and only less than half percent uh, should be in closed systems or those that emit uh, gravitational waves. So it's clear that the population we see that we observe now is just the tip of the iceberg of this huge population of black holes that should be out there in the Milky Way. And uh, our goal is to try to understand that uh, population of black holes. And this is why this, uh, this uh, research topic has, been, uh, has become very popular in recent years. You might have um, <laughs> remember that paper from Nature from 2019, where people claimed the discovery of a 70 solar mass black hole in a nearby star. And within a week after this discovery, it turned out that it's bogus, it's not real. Uh, and this measurement was incorrect because uh, incorrect measurements. And over the, over the past years, there have been several such papers claiming the discovery of a black hole in a binary star system. And all of these uh, papers Turned out, to, turned out to be wrong, incorrect. So uh, it only shows you know, how difficult it is uh, to detect uh, black holes and neutron stars. And I would say that in the past uh, year or so, we had like three or four secure detections of uh, black holes in non-interacting binary star systems. Uh, with masses of 10 and 9 and 30 uh, Jupiter, uh, 30 uh, solar masses, I would say these are the only three robust uh, and re reliable uh, detections of uh, black holes uh, in the Milky Way. So this situation shows you that we have to find some other method that will mm -hmm. allow us to detect and characterize uh, black holes and neutron stars uh, in the Milky Way. Uh, this method is maybe uh, gravitational microlensing. Uh, I'm not sure if you are familiar with this technique. So uh, microlensing is an effect that is predicted by Einstein's uh, theory of uh, general relativity, which basically says that the light may be bent by the gravity of massive objects. And so imagine you have a distant star located somewhere in the galactic center, about uh, 25,000 light years away from the Earth. And suppose that you have a third body that is moving between the source of light and observer on Earth. If this third object, which is called the lens, is almost perfectly aligned with the source of the observer, the gravity of the lens will is going to bend and deflect the light from the source. As and as a consequence, you will observe a temporary brightening of this 
otherwise con constant uh, source star. We call these uh, brightening uh, gravitational microlensing events. And what is important is that uh, microlensing does not depend on the brightness of the lens. And so uh, this method allows you to find objects that are dark, uh, that do not emit any light, objects such as uh, black holes, planets, uh, Milton stars, and or all other interesting projects. Uh, what is important is that uh, duration time scales of microlensing events depend on the mass of this lensing object. Uh, and so generally, the higher the mass, uh, the longer the event, the longer the duration of the event. And so uh, for black holes, which are massive, stellar mass black holes, we expect typical uh, microlensing events with time scales of, uh, of a few hundred days. Microlensing events by stars uh, have times this uh, on the order of a few weeks, maybe 20, 30 days. Uh, whereas those by planets, planetary mass objects uh, are really short. They last uh, a couple of hours, maybe a day. So this animation shows uh, what happens during the microlensing event. Here in the center, you have the lensing object, and you will see, and you will see the source star that is moving behind it. So we don't see the source star, we see two images of the source star that are created as a result of microlensing. As you can see in this animation, uh, the size of these images is uh, greater than the size of the source star. And as, and as a result, uh, we cannot uh, resolve these images. So we measure their combined brightness. And as a result, we observe this temporary brightening of the source star, uh, the source star may be magnified a few a few hundred times with respect to the unless brightness. So these two images are called a uh, major and minor image, and uh, every microlens event has this characteristic uh, quantity, uh, which is called uh, the angular Einstein radius or Einstein ring. It gives you the separation between these two images. And for uh, typical microlensing events in the Milky Way, it is on the order of one milliard seconds, which is more or less the size of a human on the moon. So quite small. Uh, the problem with microlensing is that uh, usually you cannot predict in advance which star will be microlensed and when. So in order to, uh, and of course the probability of this uh, phenomenon is very low because you have to have three objects that are aligned in the space. So uh, if you want to find uh, a significant number of microlensing events, events, you have to observe a really large number of stars. I mean, hundreds of millions of stars to uh, detect a large number of these uh, events. And uh, there are a couple of experiments uh, in the world uh, that are dedicated to uh, those searches, uh, searches for measurements events. One of them is OGL, uh, which is the uh, Optical Gravitational Lens Experiment. Uh, this is the project uh, run by astronomers from the University of Warsaw uh, since uh, 1992. Actually, I was one year old at the time, so it was like a pretty long time ago. Uh, the project has its own telescope in Chile, uh, which uh, observes the densest regions of the sky, uh, the galactic center, uh, the Milky Way plane, and also Magellanic planets. Uh, these are two nearby uh, galaxies. Uh, of course, we are interested uh, in all kinds of uh, sky variability. We are searching for uh, microlenses, the variable stars, supernova, and so on. And uh, but of course, uh, microlens is the most uh, important, one of the most important science things. So you may now ask, okay, Ogle has been observing the sky for, for the past 30 years. It's been discovering thousands of microns events. So why haven't we found any black holes so far? And the reason is that if you want to 
that if you, if you want to measure the amount of the lens, the light curve, the photometric data are not enough. So if you want to measure the mass of the lens and object, you have to need, you need two quantities. One of them is so-called uh, microlens and parallax, and uh, that parameter can be measured from the light curve alone. Um, this is the modulation in the light curve due to orbital motion of Earth around the sun. So basically, we can measure that parameter from the light curve. Okay, that's great. But also, you have to know the angular Einstein radius, this characteristic angular scale of the event. And the problem was, uh, the problem is that that parameter uh, is very hard to do measure from the light curve alone. And you need some additional observations to, uh, to get it. Uh, and um, this may be from astronaut interferometry. I'm going to talk about that uh, in a sec. And this is the reason why uh, there haven't been many mass measurements of black holes so in the past years. Uh, the first uh, path for measuring Einstein radio is by astrometry. Uh, so this is the same animation I showed you before. But on this right hand plot, I'm showing the position of the center of the light. So you can see we have two images. The brightness is changing, the position is changing. But what we can measure observationally is the position of the center of the light. And as you can see, uh, as the event progresses, this position is changing. So if you have very precise uh, telescope, precise astrometric, uh, so if you, if you measure the position of your event very precisely, you can detect that uh, effect. Uh, the problem is that this, this, this signal is very small. So the maximal deflection you can measure in the sky is like the Einstein radius divided by three. So you have to really, so you have to really, have a really precise instrument, precise telescope uh, to measure that event. Um, and uh, for example, you have to employ Hubble Space Telescope. So in the past uh, 10 years or so, uh, we have been observing several microns events with the Hubble Space Telescope. Here uh, is one of them. Uh, event Ogul 2011 462. Uh, this is one of the longest events, one of, one of the longest events in our sample. It has a time scale of about 240 days. So it looks like, it, like a good candidate for a black hole, for a good candidate for a massive uh, star. And uh, this event was observed by the Hubble Space Telescope uh, for the past 10 years from 2000. 11 up to 2022. 20, uh, These measurements are shown here uh, in these uh, bottom panels. Uh, the Hubble data became public and two independent teams analyzed them. And the problem was, well, it turned that they got different masks. So one of the teams led by Karina Saku uh, found the mass of the black hole of about seven solar masses, so solar black hole. Whereas the second team, uh, led by um, Casey Lam from Berkeley, uh, found that the, found this astrometric signal, but also found that the mass of the lens and body is smaller, between 1.6 and 4.4 solar masses. So maybe a new star or some weird low mass black hole. What's going on here? <laughs> so we wanted to uh, learn more why why these two measurements are different. Uh, I, I don't want to go in, in the detail, but you can use photometric observations to measure the direction of the motion of the lens related to the source. So this is the uh, north, east, and, and the black contours show the direction of the, of the lens source related to the motion. So, this is what the light curve tells us, the photometric data from the other tell us. Whereas here, in those straight lines are, are the directions measured by two teams 
analyzing the Hubble data. So as you can see, we immediately noticed uh, that only uh, one of the measurement is consistent with the photometry with, with the, our later data. And so we can say that the SACU result is correct. So we, we, we found that the lens, the black hole, has a mass of about eight solar masses, has a projected velocity of about 40 kilometers per second. And yeah, we can say we, we finally have the first ISO black hole uh, detected with the gravitational night lensing. That these papers were published uh, about two years ago. Uh, what about the future? Uh, observations with the Hubble Space Telescope are, are costly, and it's not easy to get them. Uh, but uh, we have another space-based uh, observatory that is constantly uh, monitoring positions of stars in the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, this observatory is called Gaia, and it's been uh, observing the sky since 2013. Uh, the Gaia data are not public now, uh, but uh, they, should be, they should be published within a year or two. So uh, we hope that by combining the data from this space-based observatory Gaia and the ground-based data from Ogle, uh, we should be able to detect astromagic microlensing signal for about 150, 100 events. And so we should, we hope to find uh, at least a couple of uh, good candidates for black holes and melting stars with those observations. Another uh, promising way of uh, measuring masses of microlensing events is using interferometry. Uh, you're a physicist, so you probably know about more about interferometry than me. But I have to show this uh, young double split experiment. Of course, we know that in, when we have two sources of two coherent sources of light, uh, the light will interfere, and we are going to observe uh, this fringe pattern regions of bright uh, bright regions when the two waves of light are uh, adding together, and uh, dark regions where, where they can cancel each other out. So we, we should see this fringe pattern. Uh, this is basically the same plot. So we have a source of light, two slits, and we see uh, this fringe pattern on the screen. When we have two sources of light that are separated, we have two waves that are two, two fringe patterns that are adding together. So, so this view we also see we also should see the fringe pattern, but a bit more complicated. Uh, the, this fringe pattern should depend on the separation between the two sources of the light, the uh, brightness ratio, maybe the position angle. Uh, and basically, this is the idea behind optical interferometry. So instead of slits, we have two telescopes that are looking at the same object in the sky. And we are combining the light from the two telescopes, and we can measure this fringe pattern. Uh, more, uh, more specifically, we are measuring uh, visibility, which depends on uh, the images of the source and the baseline, which is the distance, the vector uh, separation between the telescopes. So uh, the, the, this is the idea of different interferometry, and we would love to observe microlensing events with it because we know that microlensing, there are two, two images of the source that are created during microlensing. So we hope that we can measure the separation position angle, contrast ratio with uh, interferometric observations. Uh, in practice, this is a bit more complex. Uh, it's all, it, it, it is better to have more than one, tele, more than two telescopes. And uh, for example, if you have three telescopes, uh, you can get rid of uh, some intrinsic phase differences that are uh, that may be observed. Uh, you're measuring basically three, three pairs of visibilities, multiplying it, and measuring uh, the phase of that quantity, uh, which is nice because it doesn't depend on the uh, like environment of the telescopes. Uh, one such instrument 
has been recently uh, started operations in Chile. Uh, this is gravity. Uh, this is an instrument that is combining the light from four uh, DLT telescopes. Uh, I, I think some of you, you may have heard about them. So these are one of the largest uh, telescopes on Earth, eight meter telescopes. They can work together as one telescope. Uh, gravity is an instrument that is combining the light from all these four telescopes. And by using interferometry, it gives you very high angular resolution. So we've uh, observed, so thanks to observations within that instrument, you can measure very small angles in the sky, very small separations. And in principle, you can uh, resolve microlens events. You can resolve the two microlens images. And then you can measure the ice and radius and the mass of the lens. Uh, the problem with gravity is that even though it uses the biggest telescopes on Earth, it can only observe relatively bright objects, like 9 to 10 magnitudes in K band. Uh, so basically, there are like one micron event every two years that can be observed with that instrument. So not very much. Uh, but there have been first detections uh, in which uh, people were able to measure, resolve the images, uh, measure the Einstein radius, and measure the mass of the lens. Uh, what I would like to I would like to, to draw your attention to the fact that these measurements are imprecise. Really so we can measure the Einstein radius like with a precision of about one percent, and you can measure the mass of the lens with a precision of a few percent, which is like really really nice precision. Uh, well, the problem was that you, you, you could observe only like one event every year or maybe every two years, so it's not really efficient. But fortunately, uh, there have been like major upgrades uh, to this instrument in uh, 2022, uh, thanks to which uh, the sensitivity of the, of the instrument was significantly improved. And so uh, we could see targets that are like 14 to 15 magnitudes, so 100 times fainter than before. And this gives you access to like the vast majority of microns and events uh, in the in the Milky Way. So with this, thanks to these upgrades, you can observe 50, maybe 70 percent of all microns and events in the Milky Way. So this gives you uh, like really leap in the sensitivity. You can like instead of observing one event every year, you can observe dozens of microns and events every year, and uh, Thanks to that instrument, uh, our project, OGL, has changed its observing strategy. So we changed our fields, we changed our strategy to try to detect as many microns and events as possible so they can be targets for the new instruments. And we uh, started our pilot observations last year. Uh, we were awarded uh, a couple of hours of the observing time to test if this idea works and if that instrument works as, we, as expected. Uh, so these are the events we observed last year and we are successful. So, so last year we were able to, for the first time, uh, to use that new instrument to uh, resolve the microlens events. So these are the closure phases that I was talking about. You can model them and from that, uh, if you combine the closure phases with the light curve data, uh, you can get really precise Einstein radius, really precise mass. In this case, it wasn't the black hole, but uh, uh, it shows that uh, that this method works, the instrument works as expected, and we hope that like in the in the next few years, uh, we'll, we are going to uh, use it to detect uh, dozens of, of interesting objects. So basically, this is the idea. Uh, we keep observing microns and events with that instrument this year and hopefully next year. Uh, these interferometric observations are really efficient. So instead of waiting 10 years, like in the case of the Hubble Space Telescope, we need only one hour of observations to, to get the job done. And we hope that like in the next few years, 
Uh, thanks to combining data from Ogoland and gravity, we are going to detect dazzled black holes and hopefully we'll uh, reach that uh, a huge population of black holes that should be out there in the next world. Uh, coming back to the beginning of my talk, uh, In 2016, when Liger and Virgo announced the discovery of black holes uh, detected with uh, gravitational waves, like within weeks after that announcement, there have been a couple of papers asking, could this be dark matter or could this be primordial black holes? I, I will talk about them in a second. And, uh, The, those papers have, as, uh, as of now, as of yesterday actually, they have received about a thousand uh, about a thousand citations. So there's a huge group of people who think this is a good question, and we should investigate whether LIGO Virgo black holes are the dark matter could be dark primordial black holes. You can see that uh, here on this plot, which shows a number of papers with primordial black holes phrase in the abstract from ADF as ideas. So like right in 2016, 2017, the number of papers has soared. Uh, now that you have like one, two papers every day about the topic. So uh, it only shows you how like popular it is now within the community. Um, so primordial black holes are black holes that formed in the very early universe, uh, possibly right after the insulation phase. Uh, uh, so they, they they formed from the collapse of density perturbations. So, so we think that like the early universe was a soup of elementary particles, but there should have been some density fluctuations within it. And those density fluctuations may grow and may collapse to form black holes. This was the idea that was put forward by Hawking I think in the 1970s. Uh, and but there were many other there are many other ideas how to form such objects. Uh, you know, there have been like th thousands of papers on that. So uh, if you have a, a large number of physicists, PhD physicists, they will find some ways to produce these objects. Uh, one of the most popular uh, idea is that those primordial um, black holes can form during phase transitions in the primordial plasma. So you have different uh, you have a soup of elementary particles, and uh, if you have, and when the phase transition occurs within that plasma, it can it can generate black holes, another black holes. Uh, for example, the coupling the coupling of bosons can create black holes with um, masses of planets, planetary mass black holes. Uh, transition of quarks into hadrons can form black holes of one to thirty solar mass uh, masses. Uh, annihilation of positrons and electrons can lead to the generation of black holes with masses of millions of, millions of solar mass black holes. And this is you know, just one of the models that is out there in the literature. So here on the x-axis, you have the mass of a black hole. And on the y-axis, you have its content in the universe. So uh, this number is actually important. So one means that the whole ma dark matter is composed of black holes. So the entire dark matter is, is composed of black holes. One is 10% of dark matter, 1% of dark matter, and so on. Of course, uh, I, I think some of you may remember that uh, microlensing surveys were actually devised in the first uh, to check that idea, like back in the 1980s, 90s, to test that idea. This was this famous paper by Gordon Kaczynski to use gravitational microlensing to probe that scenario. And this uh, first generation microlensing surveys uh, basically have ruled out compact objects, you can call them matches, you can call them primordial black holes, in the very broad range, broad range of masses from 10 to minus 10. To about 10 solar masses. So, so uh, that range of masses have been ruled out by, by the previous experiments. 
But of course, in Live and Virgo uh, have detected black holes here. So uh, in principle, they, they have been ruled out. Of course, why, why was that? So uh, as you recall from the beginning of my talk, the larger the mass of the lens, the longer the event. So for 100 solar mass black holes, uh, typical time scale of the uh, Mike events is about two years. For 1,000 solar mass black holes, it's six years. For 10,000 solar mass, solar mass black holes, it's 20 years. So uh, if you want to find such massive black holes, you have to, you need long duration observations. Uh, you need decades of data to try to detect those things. But fortunately, there is only one experiment in the world that has such a data set. It's Hubble. It's been observing the sky since uh, for a long time. And in particular, we have been observing the Large Magellan Cloud. This is one of the nearby galaxies. We've been observing it. We've been observing it for over 20 years. That part of the galaxy is observed for over 20 years. In the, in the rest of the galaxy, we have like 11 years long data, which is also good enough to uh, try to detect those long time scale microns. Uh, so we have a database of about uh, 75 to 80 million stars, in light case of 80 million stars. In that database, uh, we were able to detect, actually, I was able to detect about uh, 16 short time scale microns events. And by short time scale, I mean shorter than 200 days. And it, 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 the, the, these are the light pairs. But if you look more closely at them, uh, it's very likely that, that these 16 uh, events have been produced by you know, non stellar populations, either stars in the Milky Way itself, or these could be stars in the large Magellan clouds itself. So there's not much room for uh, black hole dark matter, I would say. On the other hand, uh, we can run simulations to, to estimate our sensitivity to uh, long duration microns and events. So as you can see, for the uh, oval, uh, 20 year oval data, this is the blue curve, we have sensitivity to events with time scales as long as eight, 10 years. So we can so we can probe this uh, parameter space of uh, light of your mass black holes. Uh, and this is actually the expected number of microns events that we should see if the entire dark matter was composed of compact objects of a given mass. This is this blue and black line. So if the entire dark matter was composed of one solar mass objects we should see about like 500, 600 microns of events. If the entire dark matter was composed of 100 solar mass objects, we should see about uh, 100 events. So obviously the numbers that we found are significantly lower. So we can translate those uh, numbers into limits. Uh, these are the most stringent limits on uh, black hole dark matter. They're up there. So for 10 solar masses, Less than one person of dark matter can be composed of such objects. Less than three person is composed of 100 solar masses, uh, black holes, and less than 10 person is composed of 1,000 solar mass uh, black holes. So these are our, the most recent results that have been published. I was put on the archive uh, a few months ago. Um, some of you may uh, know that in the past few years, my classic experiments, including the Oval, have found a population of very short duration microns events that have time scales of a few hours. Uh, and what I find really uh, important is that all three microlensing surveys, major microlensing surveys, Oval, KMT, and MOA, they all, <coughs> independently of each other, have found a population of very short time scale uh, microns events. Of course, Orgel was the first back in 2017. And uh, when we found the population of short time scale microns events, we said these are likely planets, either planets, pre-floating planets, 
that is planets without any star, or planets that are really far away from the host stars. Uh, we estimate that those pre-coping planets or white orbit planets should be really common. And they they're like a couple of times more common than stars in the Milky Way. But again, there have been three experiments, and all three of them have, have measured the same thing. And like just a couple of months after my paper on pre-coping planets appeared in nature in 2017, there was another paper by a Japanese group who said, hey, could this be primitive black holes, like planetary mass black holes? <laughs> and what I find really remarkable is that paper has attracted like more citations than my original paper. So it's a really popular idea. Uh, so the, basically they said that, okay, if short time scale microlens events found by Ogu are due to planetary mass black holes, then such black holes should comprise between 1% and 10% of all dark matter. How to test that? Uh, basically, the idea is to look somewhere else. Instead of looking at the galactic center, we decided to look at the large Magellan cloud at the very high cadence. So we wanted to see if very short time scale microns events are also detected in the large Magellan cloud. Uh, we, we observed those five fields in the LMC with a cadence of about 50 to 20 minutes. So we have one image every 20 minutes. This is high enough to detect such a short time scale uh, microns events. Those campaigns started back in 2022 and has been finished actually this week, earlier this week. Uh, so we have two years of high cadence observations of uh, nuts. So far, I was able to, I, I managed to analyze one part of the data set from 2022 to 2023. Surprisingly, no short time scale microns events. So we, we have detected a couple of interesting objects, but all of them are uh, variable stars. We don't see any signature of short, of a population of short time scale microns events in the LMC. So from that, we got really strong constraints on the population of these. Uh, planetary mass uh, primordial black holes. So I, I think it's safe to say that uh, we, basically, we can basically rule out primordial black holes as dark matter in a really broad range of masses from 10 to minus 10 to 10 to, 10 to 4 uh, solar masses. Yeah, and that's my uh, summary. I would like to, you to remember that uh, you can detect um, and measure masses of black holes with gravitational microlensing, with astrometric and interplanetary observations of microlensing events. Hopefully, within a few years from now, we should have a sample of dozens of those objects with more precise measured masses. Black holes, like the video mass black holes, uh, make up less than one to three percent of uh, entire dark matter, and also pre-coating planets are planets; they are not. Planetary mass black holes. <clears throat> That's my summary. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. Questions? Okay. okay. So, when discussing this interparametric method of analyzing the microwave data, you said that you can resolve the image using interparametry. What, what exactly does this mean? Can you resolve really the two? Minor and major yes, yes, uh, this is what I meant. So, uh, gravitational microns events, two images, my, minor, major and major image are, are formed, and the separation between them is uh, on the order of two Einstein radii, like a, a few or less than one million seconds. And the resolution of the modern telescopes is like two orders of magnitude uh, worse. Mm -hmm. So, we've Single telescope observations, you, you cannot resolve those two images. Uh, you can measure only the combined variance. But if you employ interferometry, you have high enough uh, angular resolution that you can actually see. I mean, you, can, you, see, you see fringes, but from that, you can infer the separation of the images. You can infer the brightness ratio, and you can infer the position angle of one of the uh, images related to the other. Any other questions? 
Mm, I have a question about the determination of mass function. Uh, because you mentioned that the time scale of the grows as the square root of mass, but uh, if I understand correctly, it should, like it comes from the dependence on the mass of the Einstein radius. Right. right. But it show it show also show dependence on these distances and uh, right. Right. So this is the problem that the uh, time scale of the event is degenerate with with the parallax and uh, Einstein the radius. So if the, the, the time scale of the event is degenerate with the mass, distance, and the velocity uh, of the lens in the sky. So there are like three unknowns and only one parameter that we can measure. So it's highly degenerate problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to actually measure the mass, uh, you, you need actually to measure two additional observables, uh, Einstein and radius parallax. So you have so now you have three observables, time scale, Einstein radius parallax, and you have three unknowns, mass, distance, and velocity. And you actually you need you need uh, additional observations to, to get the mass. So the time scale of dependence is just rough as mm -hmm. It's just rough as okay. <laughs> From the literature, I know that um, uh, this lensing has been associated with dark energy, not with dark matter. Is that correct? And then, so how you, um, how this uh, small black hole can substitute uh, dark matter? Okay, uh, so like historically, the gravitational microlensing have been used to test if dark matter is composed of black holes, mm -hmm. dark matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I showed you, um, yeah, so so basically, using uh, gravitational microlensing observations of stars in the uh, LMC, you can rule out uh, that dark matter is composed of black holes of masses between 10 to minus 10 and 1,000 solar masses. But uh, I, I don't think uh, that uh, observations of gravitational microns in the Milky Way can be used to, to uh, study dark energy. I think maybe it's not observations of lensing the stars, but not in the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. Yes, but of like, well, Strong lenses can use yes for for measurement of the expansion of the universe, mm -hmm. but and then and then also weak lenses, but not micro lenses. Like yeah, them. yeah. So, any other questions from the audience? Uh, we will have uh, data from LSST, which will cover uh, ten years. But is it really new? Advantage to use this data in comparing because you you have whole sky on the other hand you don't have the, uh, all those uh, stars right. all, all well, over. So. But uh, as as uh, is, is of course a bigger telescope, so you mm -hmm. can probe a uh, significant larger uh, like orders of magnitude more, more stars. Uh, and if you observe more stars, you can always uh, so track on this the Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, you, you mentioned that uh, photometric, uh, photometric information is very crucial for uh, mass integration. So which photometric bands are, are really involved? Uh, right. So uh, most of microlensing events that we observe in the galactic center are, are from in the galactic center, which is obscured by dust. So uh, actually, uh, Orgul is observing in the I band, which is like uh, 800 uh, nanometers, like the red pink pair. And uh, there's a planned uh, space based mission, uh, Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, which is going to observe uh, microns events in the uh, center uh, from, from space. And uh, that mission is infrared mission. So, actually, it's better to go to infrared range simply because you can uh, see more stars thanks to lower extinction. Do you have any questions from the online news? No. Any no, questions yeah. too? Yeah. Hey, uh, the, uh, you, uh, like, you went some up here. I have actually proposed uh, replacing the dark matter with the black hole, but why it 
it happened, this proposal happening at this moment, not actually before the suggestion of documents, because it's a lo their long history. Right. So uh, actually, this problem, uh, there were like two waves of interest. Uh, first, like in the 90s, 90s, where first, when first Paczynski proposed to use gravitational microlensing to probe uh, dark matter uh, and to check if it's made of compact objects. And there was another wave of interest after uh, the LIGO vehicle discoveries. People started thinking, well, we, 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 we see some black holes that are weird. They are more massive than we than the black holes in the Milky Way. And they started to think, could they be Pinata black holes? And this is the second wave of interest in that topic. Uh, and as you can see, um, yeah, as you can see, it's really popular. 25% of matter can be replaced by the black holes, do you think? Uh, no, well, uh, well, well, our observation, our observations show that uh, that less than one person of dark matter is composed of 10 solar mass black holes and less than three percent is composed of 100 solar mass black holes. So there's, there, there, there isn't much room for black hole dark matter now, I, I would say. The only, the only open window is on the side uh, in this asteroid mass range. So uh, this, this is the only mass window that has been unprobed so far. And uh, yeah, there's uh, many theories that say that, that it may happen that the dark matter is composed of black holes of 10 to minus 12, 10 to minus 14 solar masses. Still, still dark matter. Dark, the entire dark matter can be made of, entire dark matter can be made of asteroid mass black holes, if you, yeah. But this kind of dark matter with this mass, doesn't it, isn't it the same as just having now the elementary particle? Uh, well, so ten, ten to minus twelve, it's like mass of an asteroid, so it's much uh, bigger than the mass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's a mass solar mass. It's solar mass. Yeah. But the size is twelve. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the size is twelve. It's of course much much smaller. So you, if you have an asteroid mass black hole, its uh, Schwarzschild radius is like the size of an atom. So if you have such black hole coming through Earth, you don't see anything. These things can go through Earth and you can see. Yeah. I, have a, I also have a question. Uh, when you uh, observe the, the events and you constrain the mass, you can constrain the mass quite well. But how do you know what kind of object is the lens? Because if you constrain that the mass is five uh, solar masses, there are stars of this mass. How right. can you constrain uh, what is the object? Right, so uh, from, from the light from the observation, you can measure the mass. But of course, a uh, five solar mass star is luminous, and uh, we can check if, uh, if there is uh, enough light. Uh, well, five solar mass star is pretty bright, so, so because from, from our model, we can estimate the upper limit on the brightness of the lens. And, Usually, you can rule out that the last is remains. But it will be different if you go to smaller masses. It will be more helpful for smaller masses. Yes, yes. 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 If you have a neutron star and one solar mass uh, lens in the bulge in the light center, then it's more difficult to tell the difference. Okay. It's not impossible, but it's more difficult. Any other questions from the audience here online? No, that's fine. The speaker again.